I want you all to be extremely kind to our visitor. He's just flown here on our Kansas State University King Air, and he said it was turbulent. <laughs> and those with him said it was turbulent, but he felt he was in very good hands because he had a K-State aviation and technology major uh, in the co-pilot seat and an instructor from our uh, Salina Aviation and Technology program in the pilot seat, so it's all good. Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is April Mason and I have the distinct honor of serving as the Provost and Senior Vice President here at Kansas State University. And I want to welcome you to the 162nd Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. Um, what a great day to have a Landon Lecture. Do you know what day this is? Indeed it is Kansas Day. Um, happy Kansas Day. It's appropriate that we celebrated a Landon Lecture on this day uh, commemorating the day that our state was admitted uh, to the United States, uh, to the Union, as the 34th state. And I have to tell you that uh, I've been in, lived in a number of states, and I don't remember celebrating the anniversary of the other states I lived in. But on January 29th, 1861, we joined the Union as the state of Kansas. The Landon Lectures were started in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late Kansas State University President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent public figures to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We're fortunate that Governor Landon and President McCain have less, left this legacy for us. I'd like to introduce a number of distinguished individuals uh, that are joining us in the audience. Regent Robba Moran, a member of the Kansas Board of Regents. Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chairman of the Landon Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. Thank you, Robba. We were a little late on that. Um, Mr. Edward Seaton, Chair of the Landon Patrons and Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. Dr. James Bloodgood, President of the Faculty Senate and Associate Professor in Management. Jan Taggart, Vice President of the Classified Senate. And Nate Spriggs, K-State Student Body President and uh, a Senior in Agricultural Economics. We're very pleased today to welcome Ambassador Michael Oren to the Landon Podium to join 161 predecessors bringing their thoughts and opinions on public affairs uh, and important issues of our day. Ambassador Oren was appointed as Ambassador of Israel to the United States on May 3, 2009 by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ambassador Oren grew up in New Jersey in a conservative Jewish household. After graduation from a New Jersey high school, he completed his undergraduate degree from Columbia College in 1977, a very good year to graduate from college, I assure you. <laughs> he continued his studies at Columbia, receiving a master's in international affairs in 1978, and in 1986, he earned a master's, an MA, and a PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University. Ambassador Oren is a historian and author, and he's been regaling us with his uh, historical knowledge, even in the back room. He's the author of New York Times bestselling Power, Faith, and Fantasy, and Six Days of War, June 1967, as well as The Making of the Modern Middle East, which won the Los Angeles Times History Book of the Year Award and the National Jewish Book Award. Ambassador Oren has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown, and Tel Aviv and Hebrew universities in Israel. He was also a distinguished fellow at the Shalom Center in, in Jerusalem and a contributing editor to the Republic. Ambassador Oren has been called one of the five most influential Jewish leaders in America and one of the 10 most influential Jewish leaders worldwide. 
Please help, him, help me in welcoming Ambassador Michael Oren to Kansas State University. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. I am so delighted to be at Kansas State University, and I am so thrilled to be on the ground. <laughs> Got to find that pilot who's the graduate of Kansas State and give him an honorary doctorate. <laughs> it's just terrific, really delighted. Thank you, thank you, Provost Mason. Thank you to Dr. Noel Schultz and Dr. Mr. Edward Seaton, uh, Ms. Roba Moran, the uh, wife of Senator Jerry Moran, who we've met in Israel, Dr. Jackie Hartman of the Land and Lecture Series, and my distinguished friend and colleague, uh, Roy Gilad the uh, Consul General of Israel in the Midwest, he's stationed in Chicago, and to my host here today in Kansas, Marvin um, Schneller. Thank you all, thank you all for honoring me to be part of the Landon series, uh, to be uh, part of a, of a lecture series that has included former presidents of the United States, legislators, uh, colleagues from the uh, diplomatic community, uh, thinkers, philosophers, what a great privilege this is. And I'm here to talk about the extraordinary relationship between the United States and Israel. Where to begin? Let me begin with three short vignettes, scenes from an ambassador's life, if you will. Indulge me for a second. Though the first scene actually took place before I became an ambassador. It was in 2008. 2008 was Israel's 60th birthday. And I was a professor in Israel, an historian. And one day I get a call from the US Embassy in Tel Aviv uh, from the naval attache. Would I be interested in flying out to the USS Truman, an aircraft carrier, patrolling somewhere out in the Eastern Mediterranean, and giving a lecture on the history of the US-Israel relationship? So I thought about this for about a quarter of a second. <laughs> Are you kidding? You know, I'd like to fly out to an aircraft carrier? Of course I'd like to fly out to an aircraft carrier. OK, made a date. I go out to some obscure airfield near Ben Gurion Airport there and uh, get onto a naval um, propeller plane. Oh, nobody here from the Navy. I see a few men in uniform from the Army. I don't know if you guys have ever landed on an aircraft carrier. But they didn't, you did? Did they tell you what it was going to be like before you landed? <laughs> okay. They didn't tell, obviously, this is like a naval thing, huh? It's a big joke. They strap you in, they put the ear things on, you fly two hours out. This, the, the US, U.S. Truman was out in the middle of the Mediterranean between the island of Rhodes and, and Turkey. And they don't tell you that this plane is going to go from 180 miles an hour to zero in about less than a second. <laughs> so you land, you're here, your eyeballs are somewhere out there. <laughs> they think it's very funny. I don't. And um, I get out. And, and, and here's the most extraordinary thing. There are 5,200 uh, crew members of the USS Truman. This is an American city floating out in the middle of the ocean. And they're all standing and waiting for me, an Israeli professor, to talk to them about the history of the US-Israel relationship. Why? Then I became ambassador, and I visit various cities, you know, Kansas City this morning. Once, uh, a couple months ago, I was in Denver, Colorado. And um, well, Colorado has a, a, a fairly large uh, Jewish community, but state, big state. I was a guest of the, uh, the two houses of the Assembly of, uh, of Colorado. And while I was there, both houses of the Congress of Colorado passed a resolution in support of the state of Israel, but unequivocally in support of the state of Israel, love for the state of Israel, in my presence. And both of these resolutions passed unanimously. No opposition. Zero. Why? Several months later, visiting Cincinnati. Great city, Cincinnati. And um, usually when I go to an American city, I'll try to speak to uh, local leaderships. I'll speak to the Latino leadership. I'll speak to the African American leadership, the Jewish leadership. On Sundays, I try to go to church, because we have a very important relationship with, um, with Christians in this country, more on that later. And this particular Sunday, I went to an unusual church. I went to an African-American Baptist church in a downtown part of uh, Cincinnati. 
And walking to this church, and you know, for a person who comes from a background like I do, you know, going actually seeing one of these churches with the, with the choir and the music, it was, it was so thrilling. And this entire church embraced me. The 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 the, the reception I, I received there was simply um, it was it was it was a type of, of of rapturous reception. And I was enveloped with love as the ambassador of Israel to the United States. Why? What is it about the crew members on the Truman or the House of Assemblies in Denver or this African-American church in downtown Cincinnati on a rainy Sunday morning? What do they have in common with me? I'm coming from a country that's tiny, 7,000 miles away. What's the connection here? Why is this relationship so special? And to understand it, we've got to go back. Israel was founded in 1948, but you've got to go back way beyond that. You have to go back. 400 years to the beginning of the 17th century, when the first buckled shoe lit upon a certain stone off the coast of Massachusetts. And the owner of that shoe, a gentleman by the name of William Bradford, said, come let us proclaim the word of the Zion in the new promised land, the word of the Lord in Zion. Now, William Bradford was a member of the 101 pilgrims who had come aboard the Mayflower. And he had conflated Massachusetts with Zion. Massachusetts is a very nice state, I want you to know. But how did Massachusetts become the promised land in the mind of the Puritans? And the Puritans, you may know, was, uh, was a dissenting Protestant sect in 17th century England. They had suffered terribly at the hands of the national church. And in an effort to find a model that enabled them to better cope with their suffering, they looked into the Bible, quite naturally. They looked into the New Testament. They didn't find the model they wanted, but they looked further back into the books that they called the Old Testament. And there they found something very unusual. They found a God who spoke to his people in their own language. God in the Bible speaks one language, speaks Hebrew. And he made them a promise. He promised to rescue them from exile, to restore them to their promised land. And the Puritans read this story, and they loved this story. They embraced this story. It became their story. They became the new Israel, the new Jews. England became the new Egypt. The Atlantic Ocean became the new Sinai that they had to cross, the desert. And they landed in a new promised land of America. And they immediately imposed the map of the old promised land on the new promised land. So if you go to the East Coast, you have about 1,000 place names, towns, cities, that are Hebrew names. You have your Jerichos, and your Bethlehems, and your Bethanies, and your Bethels. These are all Hebrew names. And they gave Hebrew names to their children. They called them David, and Rebecca, and Isaac, and Leah. They made Hebrew a required language at all of their universities. James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton, and he failed. <laughs> I know the feeling. Had to do an extra year at Princeton because of his Hebrew. So deeply ingrained was the Hebrew biblical narrative in the minds of the founding fathers and mothers of this country that at the conclusion of the American Revolution in 1783, there was a debate among the American leaderships over what was going to be the great seal of the United States of America. And there were some American leaders who thought it should be the American bald eagle. But there was another group of American leaders that said, no. The image of the United States should show Moses leading the children of Israel out of the promised land, out of bondage, and into the promised land. And there was a very intense debate about this over the seal. And America came this close to having Moses as its national symbol. Moses lost out, alas, to the, to the follically challenged bird. But you should know that the, that the designers of the Moses seal were none other than Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. That's how deeply they had internalized the biblical Hebrew narrative. Now, for many of the Puritans and their descendants, the fact that they were the new Jews meant that they had a kindred relationship, a kinship, with the old Jews. And the fact that they were now the heirs to a new promised land meant that they had a strong connection with the old promised land, known in the Bible as the land of Israel. And they concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to help those old Jews get back 
to the land of Israel and restored their ancient statehood. The notion of restorationism, and it wasn't a, a, a peripheral idea in colonial and post-colonial America, it was very mainstream. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said that it was his greatest dream that 100,000 100, Jewish soldiers would march back into Judea, as he called it, and reclaim it as a Jewish kingdom. Abraham Lincoln, 1863, said it was his dream to help the Jews go back to their land and to restore their sovereignty once he had restored unity in the United States after the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson, the grandson and son of Presbyterian ministers, when asked by the British whether they should issue a declaration supporting the creation of a Jewish national home in what was then known as Palestine, and the British were debating this, Woodrow Wilson came out and gave his full support to that declaration. Asked why he did it, because his own Secretary of State said, don't do it. There'll be an oil boycott of Israel, of, of the United States. He says, I did it because to think that the son of Presbyterian ministers would have the honor of restoring the Jews to their holy land. Woodrow Wilson. And the British issued that declaration. It was known as the Balfour Declaration. And in 1947, that became the basis of the UN partition resolution, creating a Jewish and an Arab state in Palestine. And the Jewish state was set to come into being on May 14th, 1948, a Friday. And again, all of the foreign policy establishment in Washington, the State Department, the Defense Department, the Pentagon, advised the President of the United States not to recognize that Jewish state. It would be terrible, said there would be, there would be an oil boycott of the United States. Europe would fall to the communists. The Jews of that country don't know how to defend themselves. They've never had an army before. The United States Army is going to have to go in there to defend them. Don't recognize the Jewish state. And the president at the time, a gentleman by the name of Harry Truman. Harry Truman had grown up a strict Baptist. He claimed to have memorized the Old Testament by age 14. And after listening to the counsel of all of his senior advisors, locked himself into the White House for 48 hours. And at 11, at 6, 11 p.m., on May 14, 1948, it's 11 minutes after the state of Israel declared its independence, Harry, Harry Truman made the United States the first nation on earth to recognize the newly created Jewish state. And he too was asked, why did you do this? Everybody told you it was going to be a disaster. Why did you do it? And Harry Truman had one answer. He said, I'm Cyrus. I'm Cyrus. I see some of you nodding your head. Some of you know your Bible. In the Old Testament, of course, Cyrus is the ancient Persian king who fulfills, the pro who fulfills the promise. He rescued the Jews from exile and restored them to their holy land. I'm Cyrus. Now, America remains today the most religiously observant country in the industrialized world. More people, more Americans attend a house of worship of one type or another. It would be a church, a mosque, a synagogue in this country than in any other industrialized country. And people are still reading their Bible, still reading God's promises to the Jewish people to restore them to their promised land. And they take that promise very seriously. Support for Israel in this country is at a near all-time high. Roughly three-quarters of Americans define themselves as pro-Israel. And the spiritual connection here is absolutely essential. It's, a, it's an essential component of that three-quarters support. But Israel comes into being in 1948 not only as a Jewish state, it comes into being as a democratic state. And it's the only functioning democracy in the Middle East for many, many years. It's a country which, like the United States, has representative government. It has a rule of law. It has full equality for all of its citizens. Our Declaration of Independence is drawn directly from the American Declaration of Independence, promising full equality not only for religion and creed, and race, but also for sex. In 1948, already we're recognizing equality between the sexes. And um, we are a country in which nobody is above the law, um, including former presidents of the country who have been found guilty of various offenses. Um, nobody is above the law. We are, a one, we are part of a very small club in the world, a very select club of countries like the United States, Canada, 
Australia, New Zealand, that have never known a second of non-democratic rule. Think about that. Very few countries. Most countries in the world go through periods where they haven't had democracy. And in spite of the tremendous pressures that Israel has endured since its creation, not a moment of peace, we've never succumbed to non-democratic rule. Israel is the only country in the Middle East that has a memorial for 9-11 outside of Jerusalem. We're the only country in the Middle East that has a memorial for Martin Luther King. We actually observe Martin Luther King Day. We have a memorial for John F. Kennedy outside Jerusalem in the Jerusalem forest. We're the only country in the Middle East that has not one, but two replicas of the Liberty Bell. One of them right down the street from my home in Jerusalem, Liberty Bell Park, inscribed with the words from Leviticus, from the Bible, may freedom ring throughout the land, from the Bible. So you had these strong spiritual connections. You had the democratic shared values. What you didn't have was a strategic alliance. Everyone, someone says that Israel and the United States have been allied you know, strategically, militarily since 1948. It's not true. In 1967, there was a war, a six-day war, in which Israel defeated several Soviet-backed Arab armies. And uh, on the, we fought that battle entirely with French arms. Didn't use a single American bullet in that battle. And on the seventh day, as it were, American policymakers woke up and said, whoa, there's this anti-Soviet powerhouse in the Middle East. We should be aligned with that country. And thus was born the US-Israel Strategic Alliance, which has flourished and burgeoned manifoldly ever since. Where to begin? Where to begin? In joint training between US forces and Israeli forces, whether it be an anti-missile uh, companies or special forces. We just had our largest ever joint maneuver uh, in the fall between the US Army and the, Ameri and the Israeli defense forces. In um, the development of anti-missile technology, Israel and the United States have developed together the most advanced multi-layered uh, anti-missile systems in the world. Uh, beginning with the Iron Dome system, which is for short-range missiles, which has proven to be the first and only uh, anti-missile system to um, work in combat conditions. During the recent fighting in November, uh, the Iron Dome system took down 85% of the short-range missiles uh, that were fired at Israeli cities, and that's an historic record. Israeli uh, American naval vessels they ports of call visit at Haifa. They love Haifa. The sailors love Haifa. Um, Israeli mili American military planes land in Israel and en route to other stations eastward. The United States prepositions about a billion dollars in military equipment in the state of Israel for use by American forces. We have probably the best uh, intelligence sharing relationship uh, anywhere that the United States has with any other foreign country in the world. Um, where you hear it all the time from the intelligence committees in the Senate and the Congress that there's nothing approaching the U.S.-Israel intelligence uh, cooperation. We are involved in armoring American vehicles. There's a little kibbutz. You know, a kibbutz is a, a communal farm in, in northern Israel, in the Galilee. It was actually founded by Americans back in 1949. That little kibbutz has provided armor for 20,000 American military vehicles serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. I get the letters from the parents and the grandparents. Thank you for saving our kids, because the armoring is so effective. We provide um, anti-ballistic uh, uh, mechanisms for American armored vehicles, for Strykel vehicles, for Bradley vehicles. All that made by the state of Israel, we provide drone aircraft um, for the state of Israel. And every American military aircraft, whether it be fixed wing or helicopters, incorporates Israeli components and Israeli concepts. Israel is in every single one of those, of those aircraft. And Israel is not only involved in the battlefield, in, um, in promoting American defenses, Israel also saves lives. There's a small uh, startup company in Jerusalem that developed a high-tech bandage that applies pressure from the inside to a wound. And uh, you may remember this terrible incident in you know, Arizona several years ago when Congresswoman Gabriella Giffords was shot. Well, the SWAT team present at that horrible incident had one of these Israeli bandages in its medical kit, and they applied it to her wound immediately and saved her life. Israel has provided a million of those bandages to American fighting forces. 
So there's really nothing like this relationship between the United States and Israel on the battlefield or in medical, medical hospitals or in the intelligence sharing community. There's nothing like it. So you have the spiritual connections, the democratic shared values, the military alliance. But now there's a fourth pillar in the U.S.-Israel relationship. You know, I spent about 30 years studying this relationship, and I thought before I got into the job as ambassador that I pretty much knew it all. And then I got into the job and found out, very humbling, that I knew relatively little, that the fact that the U.S. relationship with Israel was more multifaceted and deeper than anything I had contemplated. And one of the areas where it is deep, deep and growing increasingly deeper is the area of commercial connections. Israel today is America's 20th largest customer in the world. We're the 12th largest uh, export destination for the United States. We've surpassed Russia, Ireland, Spain, Argentina as an American customer. At a time when American companies are, many of them outsourcing to Asia, Israeli companies are outsourcing to the United States. Tens of thousands of Americans are employed by Israeli companies, whether it be making high-tech products or hummus. You know what I mean? Hummus comes from a great little factory in Virginia. It's an Israeli company. Uh, Teva, the world's largest generic drug company, is an Israeli company. Teva means nature. Um, you should never have to take too many pills, but one out of every five pills you take in this country is a Teva pill. Um, Tens of thousands of people are employed by Teva. Uh, amazing. I was the first Israeli ambassador ever to go to Puerto Rico uh, because it's in my district because Teva employs thousands of people in Puerto Rico. Um, fascinating. Um, Israel is the third most represented country on the NASDAQ high-tech exchange after small little countries like China and, uh, and the United States. We're only 8 million people. We're the third most represented country on the NASDAQ exchange because we're a high-tech giant. And in fact, the United States and Israel, Silicon Valley and Israel, are viewed as one body by the world high-tech community. And why is that? We have the, after the United States, we have the highest number of startup companies in the world, about 5,000 startup companies. We devote about half of our national income to R&D, to research in high-tech. Um, Israel um, developed, we're actually in all of your computers, we're in all of your cell phones, everything from the intuitive uh, browser, you know, when you type in University of, you know, when you type in Kansas State and it comes up as Kansas State University on your browser, that's an Israeli invention. Your USB flash drive is an Israeli invention. All of that comes from the state of Israel. And all of the American, major American um, high tech companies, whether Microsoft, Motorola, um, Intel, in, have their RD centers in Israel. Intel has two RD centers in Israel, and now Apple is opening its first overseas research and development center in the state of Israel, so your Apple products will also be developed uh, in Israel as well. It's extraordinary, extraordinary development that's occurred over the, really over the last 20 years. Trade between the United States and Israel over the last two decades has increased by 350%. 350%. Folks, we're living through turbulent times through the Middle East. Uh, the entire region is roiling. Look at the papers today, what is occurring in North Africa, Egypt, Syria. Everywhere you look, we are engaged in change. The United States and Israel are together meeting these challenges. Do we agree on everything? At times, we have not agreed on everything. We've had disagreements over the status of Jerusalem. It's very interesting. With this close relationship, it's one of the few alliances in history where one member in the alliance doesn't recognize the capital of the other. Right? For the record, Israel does recognize Washington, D.C. as the capital of the United States. <laughs> um, we've had differences on matters relating to the peace process. We've had differences relating to the Iranian nuclear challenge. But the fact of the matter is today, on both these issues, our positions are almost identical. We both call for the direct and immediate resumption of peace talks between Israel and the Palestinian leadership leading to a two-state solution for two peoples. We both committed to preventing Iran from developing and acquiring nuclear weapons. The great litmus of any alliance is not whether the two partners to the alliance agree on everything. The great test is how you can overcome those differences and how you can move forward and find common ground. And on every test, every crucible, the US-Israel alliance has proven to be one of the great and unbreakable friendships in history. Looking forward to the Middle East, 
two years from now, two weeks from now, two hours from now. Nobody can tell you what's going to happen in this region. I come from the field of history. As an historian, I had enough problems predicting the past. <laughs> I am not going to tell you what's going to happen in the Middle East in the next two hours. There's one thing that you can count on, one certainty about our region. And again, whether it's two hours, two weeks, two years, 20 years, there's going to be one country in this region which is stable, which is economically robust, which has a citizen's army which is larger than the British and French armies combined, which has never known a nanosecond of non-democratic governance, and which is unabashedly, unreservedly, unequivocally pro-American. You will never find an anti-American demonstration in the state of Israel. Never, American flags are never burnt in the streets of Israel. They're waved in the streets of Israel. Come on our Independence Day when Israelis wave Israeli flags and American flags together. And there's no substitute for that. Just as there's no substitute for Israel for the United States of America, for the United States of America there's no substitute for the state of Israel. Israel is not only America's ally, Israel is America's ultimate ally. And I thank you. Thank you, April. Questions? Oh, you're nice and warm. <laughs> We have microphones at the edge of each aisle, and the ambassador has indicated that he will take questions. So um, uh, wait till I acknowledge you to ask your question, and we'll kind of alternate across the uh, uh, different mic microphones. Okay. Step up to the plate. Here we go. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> ambassador Oren. Yes. My name is Mohamed Alhamdi from the Econ Department. You touched on the Iranian nuclear program, mm -hmm. and if you can express more of the state of Israel's stand on that, because we hear the official stand is to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. which is a very noble goal. But the problem is how to reach that. Israel is talking about surgical operations, and we know they did that in 1981 with the Iraqis, and it did not stop the Iraqi nuclear program. Sanctions is not working with North Korea. So what is the practical approach from the state of Israel point of view if they want to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Excellent question. Thank you, Thank Mohammed. You. Understand that a, a, a nuclear-armed Iran um, poses not one but several existential threats to Israel. It's unusual in that way. Um, there's the threat that Iran will get a nuclear device, stick it on top of one of its many missiles that it has that can hit any city in Israel. They can hit any city in the Middle East. They can hit, actually hit most cities in Eastern Europe already. That's just the beginning of the threat. The next threat is that once Iran acquires military nuclear capabilities, that is the ability to make a missile, it can provide that, those capabilities to the many terrorist groups that are supported by Iran, and you won't need a missile. All they'll need is a, a, a ship container. And the third threat is that once Iran acquires these capabilities, other countries in the Middle East will acquire those capabilities. You may have noticed reading the news in the last couple of days, we've been very worried together with the United States and other Middle Eastern countries about the fate and control of the Syrian chemical arsenal, very big arsenal. Um, if other countries in the Middle East, especially countries whose futures are uncertain, acquire nuclear stockpiles, we'll be worrying about that and not about chemical weapons. So that would be also be an existential threat for us. How do you stop it? And it's not a trivial question. You're right, very complicated. It, um, we have long supported uh, President Obama's leadership of the sanctions um, program in the world. Sanctions against Iran have proven more effective than just about anybody ever predicted. They've taken a huge chunk out of the Iranian economy. They've sent the Iranian currency into a nosedive. They're hurting. Alas, the sanctions have not stopped the nuclear program, as in North Korea. In fact, according to UN observers, the nuclear program is accelerating. They've got more. Uh, highly enriched uranium. They've built more underground bunkers and faster. We still believe that a combination of escalating sanctions linked with a credible military threat can perhaps per dissuade the Iranian regime from pursuing these nuclear weapons. Why the credible nuclear threat? 
about the credible military threat. Credible military threat means that when Iranian leaders decide, OK, they're, they're thinking to themselves, we're paying a high price for this program. But at the end of the day, we're actually going to have something to show for it. We're going to have the nuclear device. But if they can be persuaded that they're paying the price for naught, that they won't have, it, have, the they won't have the device at the end of the day because there'll be a military option, then we think they could be dissuaded. That is why both we and the United States, together, say that all options remain on the table, with one exception. There's, containment is not an option. And, um, and I, you know, when the, when the President of the United States, when President Obama says he's not bluffing, I believe him, he's not bluffing. And Israel, too, has a right to defend itself, and we have the right and the capabilities to defend ourselves. And um, with, a, with a regime that is promising to wipe us off the map, uh, virtually on a, uh, a, a daily, a weekly, if not a daily basis, uh, we have to take that very seriously. And uh, this is a regime that's also supporting terror around the world, supporting terror around the region. It's not just an Israeli interest, folks. It's, it's a Middle Eastern interest. This is the same regime that's backing Bashar al-Assad, that's killing 60,000 of his own citizens. It's supporting terror around the world. This is a regime that plotted to blow up a restaurant in downtown Washington, D.C., plotted to blow up our embassy. You do not want these people to have nuclear weapons. You do not. Sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Jake Seaton. Uh, last week in the parliamentary elections, the centrist party won, I believe it was 19 seats, mm -hmm. uh, which is still nothing compared to like Mr. Netanyahu's party. However, my question is, do, do you believe this has any significance for either the U.S.-Israeli relationship or the Palestinian peace process? Mm. Good question. Um, I, think it, um, I think that if the Palestinians come back to the negotiating table. And uh, unfortunately, for the last four years, with the exception of about six hours in September of 2010, they haven't come back to the negotiating table. I think that they'll find a, um, an Israeli government that, that is not just willing to negotiate, but willing to make the hard decisions. And we understand that a, a making this two-state solution will involve painful sacrifices, painful sacrifice for the Palestinians, painful sacrifices for us. And um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, now, two years ago, in addressing uh, the joint session of Congress, said, we're going to have to be honest with ourselves, that in the event of the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, there are going to be Israeli settlements that are going to lie beyond Israel's borders. And that's going to be a tough call for him. And I think that the, um, the, uh, the outcome of the elections, now it's too early, because now we're, we're forming a, a coalition. In, in the United States, you vote for the quarterback, mostly an election, maybe a linebacker or two. In, in Israel, in our election, we vote for the whole team including the special teams. So um, we're, we're now in the process of putting together the dream team and uh, the pro ball you know, in Israel, in Israeli terms. I think at the end of this process, um, we'll have a, a stable, widely representative Israeli government that will represent center, center's left, center right, um, and we'll be able to make the difficult choices. All we need is for the Palestinians to sit down with us at the negotiating table. I think you've got a, a, an administration in Washington that's very committed to reaching peace, and we welcome that commitment, and we hope the Palestinians will avail themselves of what I think is a unique opportunity in history. Ambassador Aaron, uh, my name is Ober. I am a graduate student in industrial engineering, so maybe not a foreign policy expert. Um, my question is that um, on the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, Israel has not completely accepted, mm -hmm. or ha actually has not accepted at all, the Arab Peace Initiative that would actually go for a two-state solution mm -hmm. and at the same time stop the entire war that happens between skirmishes, rather, between Israel and Palestine. And we have not, as those who are looking from the Arab world, not seen any progress saying that the Arab Peace Initiative is not the solution. Why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. well, okay, so let me just correct the misconception. Um, we have accepted the Arab Peace Initiative as one of the bases of the peace talks. It's not true that we, we've rejected it, and um, we think it's constructive. We think it's, it, the Arab Peace Initiative um, calls for, uh, it says that the, the Arab world will recognize Israel, accept Israel's existence once we withdraw to the 67 borders. Um, redivide Jerusalem and, um, and find a, a, an equitable solution for the refugee problem. Um, 
we have a problem with the 67 borders because they were not uh, defensible. Israel's borders before 1967 were eight miles uh, wide, uh, with our face to the mountains and our back to the seas. We want defensible borders. Um, we have accepted the, the, the president's formula, which says that the 67 borders with mutually agreed swaps means that the parties will not be going back to 67 borders. This is getting sort of diplomatic um, you know, insider ball, but understand that, that, that the 67 borders are one of the parameters, but not the only parameters. And, um, and our position on Jerusalem is different. So what we say is the Arab Peace Initiative can be one of the bases of peace negotiations, but not the only bases of peace negotiations, because there are things, there are aspects of the, peace, the, of the Arab Peace Initiative that have to be negotiated between us and the Palestinians, including the status of Jerusalem. And Prime Minister Netanyahu says, our position is that Jerusalem should remain the undivided capital of, of Israel, but we understand that the, that the Palestinians have a different position, and we understand that the Palestinians are going to bring that position to the negotiating table. So we're going to negotiate. We understand we don't like the 67 borders. We understand the Palestinians like the 67 borders. We're going to have to negotiate about it. The refugee issue for us is an existential issue because today there in the world many millions of Palestinian refugees and their descendants, people this is now grandchildren and great-grandchildren, if they were to come back to what they call pre-67 Israel, Israel would not be the Jewish state anymore. It would be a Palestinian state named Israel. So we think that the Palestinian refugees should be settled in the Palestinian nation state. So that has to be negotiated as well. So what I'm saying is the Arab Peace Initiative is constructive. We welcomed it as a contribution, and we will serve as one of the bases of the negotiations. Hi, Ambassador Orrin. My name's Ames Howard. Um, two days ago was International Holocaust Day. Um, I'm sure you'll agree this was an important day uh, for the nation of Israel. Um, I was just, let's see here, um, from what I've been able to find in my own research in many Palestinian and uh, Arab textbooks, a lot of Jewish and Israeli history is actually not taught. Um, from what I was able to find also that in a lot of Israeli history books um, for students that a lot of Arab and Palestinian history to that land was also not taught. I was just wondering if you thought if uh, both sides were actually taught more about the other's history and their point of view, do you think that would uh, help in resulting uh, better communication towards of mm. grounds of peace? Thank okay, you. thank you, Herc. Um, you know, I, I, I taught history for many years. Um, at the, at the university level um, in Israel. And um, all I can say is that um, from my perspective and the perspective of history departments in Israel, uh, we do teach uh, the Palestinian narrative. We teach it as the Palestinian narrative. I don't think that that is reciprocated on the Palestinian side. I think that uh, the Palestinians could do a much better job uh, preparing their young people for peace. And I think that, that um, the lack of preparation has been recognized not just by Israel but by the United States as well. More has to be done there. But I'll go beyond saying what I just said and say that in order for there to be true peace, we do not have to accept one another's narratives. Um, we, the Israelis, have a narrative of, of repatriation, of coming back to our homeland, of um, reestablishing our ancient sovereignty based on 4,000 years of history. We have a, a, a narrative of emerging from the ashes of the Holocaust. We have, emer we have a narrative of draining the swamps and making the desert bloom and absorbing uh, millions of immigrants from around the world. That's our narrative. Palestinians have a different narrative. They have a different narrative of dispossession. We're not going to accept one another's narratives. What we're going to have to do to make peace is recognize that we have different narratives and learn to make peace between those narratives. And understanding they're never gonna be able to be reconciled entirely. They will clash. But to understand them, and I for one, speaking not as an ambassador, but as Israelis, I recognize that there's a different narrative. The Palestinians have their narrative. We have to respect their narrative. And we're gonna to have to, well, someday, around the negotiating table, the narratives will become very important. Good morning, Ambassador. I'm Captain Jessica Dwyer, United States Air Force, also born and raised in the great state of New Jersey. Yay. <laughs> yes. um, sir, can you tell us, following the Benghazi attacks, what sort of increased security measures were taken at your consulate or others in the Middle East? Mm. Um, thank you. I always say I spend more time defending the state of New Jersey than I do defending the state of Israel. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Lovely state. No one ever makes fun of Kansas. You know? Oh, well, not in the same way. Um, we, um, we, we respond 
to threats. You know, obviously, I can't go into great detail about this. Um, we've had threats. I mentioned obliquely in passing just recently that uh, at the same time, you remember there was a plot to, to kill my Saudi uh, counterpart in Washington, uh, an Iranian plot, and, uh, and blow up a restaurant. At the same time, there was a, we discovered there was a plot to blow up our embassy. And um, you should know that basically we, we employ dozens of American citizens at our embassy too, especially young people, uh, interns. And it would have been a horrendous, uh, a horrendous tragedy and aggression if it had occurred. So during that period, we had to go on very high alert. And you know, we doubled all of our security members. Measures. Needless to say, we are always on high alert. Israel is a target. Iran, just, just Iran, for example, has, has either plotted to or successfully carried out terrorist attacks um, across five continents in 25 cities, including Washington, DC. Um, there have been attacks against our embassies in India, in, um, in Thailand, um, in Tur Turkey, Cyprus. I can give you a whole list. And we have, our, our, we, have to, we have to respond to fluctuations in alert levels, just as the American embassies do. And we know how complex that is. I had to get used to having security details around me. I believe me, it was one of the greater challenges of being an ambassador, never being alone. All right? All right. Hi. Um, <laughs> sweet guy. Very sweet guy, but you know, you know um, and you get used to it. And sometimes we have, sometimes those, those levels will go up. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Oren, first off, I'd like to thank you for our, your service to our country. Um, and my question was, um, since there seems to be an escalating conflict with Iran and potentially a war between Israel and Iran um, in the f near future. Why, and for, and because Palestine being a big reason for that and the not, rec not recognizing them as a nation and having the peace talks, why is the U.S. not more forthright with the peace negotiations? All right, uh, first of all, on the Iranian issue, understand that no country in the world has a greater interest in finding a diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear threat than Israel has. We, we have the most skin in the game. We, we are threatened with, with national annihilation. We are in Iran's backyard. We're the small country, the size of New Jersey, by the way, um, <laughs> with, with half, because 62% of, 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 of our country is, is, is desert. Um, so we, we, we have a desire in avoiding a conflict with Iran. So what we're trying to do by supporting the, by, by supporting the sanctions and by calling for a credible military threat. Responding to Mohammed's question earlier, thank you. Um, as for the Palestinian issue, listen, the, the, the Obama administration, as, by the way, as the Bush administration before it, and we have to be fair about this, the administration convened the Annapolis uh, conference in 2007, which was a peace conference, have been committed to trying to get the Palestinians to agree to the two-state solution. Now, there are a number of, a number of obstacles. Israel, both in the year 2000 and the year 2008, made two-state solution offers to the Palestinian leadership, which called, which those offers included all of Gaza, uh, just about the entirety of the West Bank, about 95% of the West Bank, and half of Jerusalem, and both times those offers were turned down. Beyond that, we have, we have deeper problems. We have deeper problems that Israel, we call for, and the United States too, and the um, call for the creation of a solution based on two states for two peoples which means that we in Israel recognize that there is a Palestinian people endowed with an unassailable right of self-determination. We cannot get the Palestinians to say the same thing about us, that the Jews are a people endowed with the same right to self-determination. You'll have Palestinian leaders who say they'll support the two-state solution, but not two states for two peoples. And we believe that that is the only way that there will ever be permanent and legitimate peace. You recognize me, I recognize you, and we live side by side. We still can't get the Palestinians to agree to what we call end of claims, end of conflict. You know, when you, when you have a peace agreement, you sign on a line and says, okay, now we've made peace. But according to the Palestinian position right now, you sign on the dotted line and you create two states, but that's not the end of it. You, then you can begin to start pressing further claims, which means the conflict goes on. Uh, Ehud Barak, our defense minister, has called this not the two-state solution, but the two-stage solution. In which the second stage is Israel's dissolution. Um, we can't have that either. So there are obstacles along the way. At the end of the day, there is, no, there is no alternative to sitting down 
at a table and threshing out all of these problems. Uh, unfortunately, the Palestinians have now moved sort of unilaterally in the UN to declare their statehood there. It was unfortunate, but if they come back to the negotiating table, our position is, and I say this, I can't emphasize this, our position is renewed direct peace talks without preconditions today in Jerusalem, in Ramallah, in Kansas, we don't care as long as they sit with us. This sir. discussion is wonderful, but this will have to be our last oh. one. Okay, thank you. I'm very sorry. I feel us. honored. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm very sorry. Uh, my name is Fadi Aramuni. I'm a professor of food science here. I'm a native of Lebanon. Uh, I was there during the 2000 war, Israel Hezbollah war. I happened to be with my family. And, uh, 2006. It's 2006. And looking at the Title 18 at the time of the United States Code of Federal Regulation defining terrorism, it talks about the targeting of civilian infrastructure. And yet, during that war, so many Israeli leaders came out, particularly saying they will destroy infrastructure in Lebanon. Right. And, and I saw I were without water, without electricity, mm -hmm. uh, both the Human Rights Watch and the Amnesty International condemned both Israel and Hezbollah for targeting civilians, and rightly so, in my opinion. Uh, don't you think that's taken away, chipping away at Israel's supposedly moral high ground? Uh, and also, a couple of things. First, I want to correct you with all respect. I think Lebanon is another democracy that's been in the Middle East. Uh, and speaking of Haifa, my mother, Mrs. Haifa, she's been she was thrown out by Jewish terrorists in 1948 of her home and her family. For in Haifa. Haifa. For 65 years. Do you think <laughs> it's fair that a person does not get to see her home, does not get reimbursement for home? I'd like to give you a copy of that deed. Maybe you can talk to someone, mm -hmm. reimburse me. I need to get my kids at K-State. It's getting very expensive here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, your, your, your first name again? Fadi. Fadi. Hi, Fadi. So you asked several questions. You asked about the 2006 war, you asked about um, Haifa, and you asked about democracy in Lebanon. Okay, so let, let's, let's take them one at a time. Um, you know, uh, I've, you know, we have a, a citizen's army, and we have, um, we have a, a very active reserve uh, units um, that continue. We continue serving well into our, uh, our 50s in Israel. And um, I participated in all of these wars. I participated in the first Lebanon war. I participated in what we call the second Lebanon war. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience here, including the 2008 uh, Gaza operation. As recently as that, I was still in uniform and um, with the gray hair and all. And all I can tell you about the 2006 Lebanon war, remember, the war was started by Hezbollah. They, they conducted it. They, they ambushed one of our, of our units uh, that was patrolling on our side of the border, killed eight soldiers, and we struck back. Then Hezbollah struck back with um, thousands of rockets fired at our civilian cities, including Haifa. I, I actually showed up for, for duty in Haifa, and we were being shelled at the time. And I reported duty under shell fire, uh, under rocket fire, thousands of rockets. Now, with Hezbollah, we face, as with Hamas in, in the Gaza Strip, we face a, a huge problem. They embed themselves in civilian areas. In Beirut, their headquarters was right in downtown uh, Beirut. They, we, I have brought to the NSC at the White House pictures of Hezbollah rocket sites that are built literally inside civilian houses. The roof rock opens up, they shoot. They want us to shoot those houses because Hezbollah not only has a military strategy, it has a media strategy. It has a diplomatic strategy. It knows that when we strike back, we're going to be in a position of hurting civilians, and we will be condemned by the international media, and we'll be condemned in you know, international forums like the UN. A great uh, study to read. Marvin Kalb, very esteemed uh, uh, journalist and historian, wrote a study for Harvard Kennedy School called uh, Hezbollah's Victory in the Media War of 2006. I strongly recommend it. I actually had it translated and given it to the, uh, to the Israeli general staff. It was such a great piece of work. Look how they did it. And they are trying to create a situation where we have to strike back at civilians. Today, now what is this, now close to seven years after this war, Hezbollah has not only quadrupled the number of rockets in its arsenal, and has the largest ro rocket arsenal in the world, over 70,000 rockets, but in southern Lebanon they have built rocket installations under villages. Literally under villages. There are about 25,000 rockets south of the Litani River. 
under villages. If they start shooting at us, we're going to have to shoot at the villages. And it's going to be a tremendous moral dilemma for us. And we will have to face probably sanctioning and, and obliquely on an international level. It will be unpleasant. Does this mean we don't make mistakes? Thadi, we make mistakes. And dealing in, in densely populated areas, whether it be in Beirut or in Gaza, with an enemy that often doesn't wear a uniform, that embeds itself behind civilian positions, there will be human tragedies. The difference between us and them is that when they shoot at our civilians, they are doing their best to kill the maximum number of Israeli civilians. When we shoot back at them, we're doing our best to minimize the number of civilians we hurt. And when they kill an Israeli civilian, it's a victory. They dance. When we kill, whether it's a Lebanese or a Palestinian, for us, it's a tragedy. It's a loss. We failed. It's a, it, there's no easy solution here. Ask anybody who served in Afghanistan and Iraq on this side how difficult that can be. Um, your second point, um, Haifa. It's funny, you know, it's kind of ironic that you shoot Haifa. Haifa was an example in the 1947-1948 war where the Jewish leadership of Haifa came to the Arab community and said, don't leave the city. Please don't leave the city. And in fact, many thousands of Arabs stayed in the city, and today they are an integral part of Haifa and go to Haifa, and if you want an example of true coexistence in Israel, go to Haifa, where you have a very successful um, uh, Arab community, particularly successful Arab Christian community. Arab Christians in Israel are per capita better educated and more affluent than Israeli Jews. Very successful community. Um, and you know, someday, when again, when we come back to the negotiating table, the question of refugees, the question of Palestinian refugees from Israel and Jewish refugees from Arab lands, greater in number, a greater number of Jews were kicked out of Arab lands, uh, will come on the ocean table, and questions of you know, reconciliation and compensation will be, will be addressed then. But again, all of it's predicated on someone sitting on the other end of the table. As for Lebanon being a democracy, Lebanon has had interregna of functioning democracies. I said Israel was the only functioning democracy in the Middle East, and you have to stress that. Um, right now, it's hard, to, it's hard to make a case that, that Lebanon is a fully functioning democracy. And don't ask me, ask uh, Freedom House, uh, which registers, actually has a scale of functioning democracies in the Middle East. It's in Washington, D.C. It's a very uh, respected uh, think tank. Israel is the only true democracy in the Middle East, according to Freedom House, and it's not an extension of the Israeli government. So my answers to you, none of it's perfect. Israel, I, I, I talked about you know, the turmoil in our region, whether it be in Syria, in Egypt, you know, there's some spillover into Lebanon. We see many threats and challenges in the region, but we also see opportunities. And no country would be happier to see the emergence of truly peace-loving, functioning democracies in the Middle East. We've been proud to say we're the only functioning democracy for the 64 years. We would be prouder and happier still to say that we are one of many in the Middle East. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank those who asked questions. I think we had a wonderful exchange of ideas. Um, I will, uh, at the reception, take the opportunity to visit with the ambassador about our um, uh, scarlet shoes and our uh, uh, other Oz uh, references. I, I don't know about uh, New Jersey, but uh, we, we deal with things here in Kansas as well, and I'll inform him. Thank you.